So uh, these folks down here, uh, Maria Genoviak, Stephen Leslie, and, and Danielle, uh, they uh, are all responsible for a lot of the information you'll see in this talk. And uh, Maria, in particular, uh, is uh, is a coordinator uh, in the uh, in this area in, in uh, northern Wisconsin. All of these folks work with uh, the Climate Change Response Framework, which is uh, essentially a, a program to get useful information into the hands of managers who can apply it and uh, begin uh, incorporating climate change information uh, into their uh, active management. Uh, check us out, Google Forest Adaptation uh, will come up as uh, one of the first choices. And uh, yes, my chest did puff out just a little bit as I said that. <laughs> So in Wisconsin, we work in several states, but in Wisconsin, we work with and through uh, a network called the Shared Landscapes Initiative. Uh, check them out, uh, they're a great group. So uh, first question, is the greenhouse effect natural or human caused? You see this out there a lot as a question, it, it, it comes up in editorials, it comes up to me as a personal question quite a bit. Is it good, is it bad, uh, is it both, how can it be both? You've all seen uh, slides like this, uh, the, uh, the greenhouse uh, effect um, uh, in a cartoon form. Uh, lots of sunlight, uh, it hits the earth, about half of it bounces out, about half of it is absorbed by the earth's surface. It's re-radiated as long wave radiation. And that radiation in long wave form is captured by greenhouse gases and then again re-radiated uh, in the atmosphere and that's what uh, causes warming. And so, uh, in fact, this is really a, a good thing. Uh, without this greenhouse gas effect, this greenhouse effect, uh, the uh, Earth's surface would have a temperature of about zero Fahrenheit, uh, which wouldn't be comfortable. Uh, with it, um, the average global temperature is, is something like 57 degrees Fahrenheit. You have a couple of critical gases in that, uh, in that, and one is is actually water vapor, and uh, then the other is the one you hear. Uh, most often as a, as a terrible culprit uh, in anthropogenic warming, and that's uh, carbon dioxide. So these are, in fact, water vapor is responsible for a lot more warming than carbon dioxide, but there's a critical difference between these two gases. Water vapor is, uh, is something that is actually driven by other uh, factors, such as temperature. It has a lifetime in the atmosphere on the order of days, maybe weeks. Uh, and then you have carbon dioxide, uh, which, of course, it is part of a natural carbon cycle, but which we've also been adding in the atmosphere. This has a residence time in the atmosphere of uh, on the order of decades or even centuries. And so what we put in uh, stays there a long time. And so uh, how can the greenhouse effect be both good and bad? Well, it's good because we would be dead without it. Uh, it is bad uh, in the sense uh, uh, for us because uh, it, it falls in one of those things of a, a little bit too much of a good thing can cause some adverse effects. And essentially that's what we've got uh, with the greenhouse effect. So that leads to this other question I get quite often, which is the atmosphere is huge. How can we actually truly affect uh, the atmosphere? And if you look at uh, fluxes of carbon, and these are giant fluxes of carbon, one of the key fluxes is uh, fossil fuel emissions uh, that go into the atmosphere. For the last 20 years, these have been on the order of maybe six and a half, seven and a half gigatons uh, per year. And now, when you think about that, uh, this addition to the atmosphere is more like a net addition. This carbon has been outside of the carbon cycle for millions of years. So it's not really a part of the carbon cycle that humans have been a part of uh, since our existence. And so when you look at, um, in addition to the fossil fuels, uh, then there's uh, an a addition to the, to the atmospheric carbon cycle of about one and a half gigatons per year from land use change. Now these are offset somewhat by sinks. There are sinks that go into the land of uh, maybe two and a half gigatons. Uh, this is great. Um, this is a very good thing. Sinks that go into the ocean of a little more than two gigatons, maybe not so great for the ocean. This results in ocean acidification, uh, which isn't good for lots of things and lots of food webs. So when you put all this together, we have a net addition to the atmosphere of around, uh, you know, three, four gigatons of carbon per year. And this, and this really begins adding up. And, and, and ultimately, of course, has added up. And uh, we have been increasing the rate of our addition of these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere over the past several decades, almost double the rate of those additions. And uh, we effectively are in line to continue that increase. So the question, how do we change something as massive as the atmosphere? Well, we add massive amounts of carbon to it. 
it's, it's essentially what we've been doing, certainly through the industrial age, uh, but for quite some time now. Uh, there's all kinds of evidence of uh, anthrop uh, anthropogenic additions, human-caused additions to the atmosphere, which uh, if I didn't only have 15 minutes, I could talk for hours about it. So just corner me and I'll go on. All right. So this leads to the, the follow-up question. These are all great questions. I love talking about them. I've asked all of them myself. It hasn't the climate always changed? So, so what's the big deal? Why, why make such an issue of this now? Well, if you look back over the last 450,000 years, and uh, this is a, uh, in the blue you've got temperature. What you see are these big cycles. These big cycles are caused by wobbles, essentially changes, perturbations in the Earth's orbit around the sun. Uh, these big cycles uh, result in, uh, in ice ages and then the times between ice ages. They, they run on the order of 100,000 years, the smaller cycles, you know, around 20 to 40,000 years. Now, what we've seen, well, I, I, I say seen, you know, maybe not technically seen, what we've measured, let's say, you're using ice cores and, and, and gas bubbles in these ice cores, is that, uh, is that you'll get one of these wobbles, it'll drive temperature first. And then CO2, 800 to 1,000, 1,200 years later, will begin to respond. And so then, as the carbon dioxide responds, uh, it, it will amplify the existing temperature trend. So it's been these wobbles, Milankovitch cycles is what they're called, that have driven temperature, and then CO2 has responded, and then CO2 has amplified the existing trend. Now, what we've done in the last 100 years or so is we have turned that system on its head. We have put out so many greenhouse gases that uh, it is now CO2 that is driving temperature, not temperature necessarily that is driving the CO2. Uh, so this is, the, uh, this is what we've done to these natural cycles. And, there, uh, and this, this change that is occurring because of the greenhouse gases that we have added on a net basis in the atmosphere is rapid. And, uh, and in fact, has been increasing. It's not just the change has happened, it's not just the temperatures have increased uh, about one and a half degrees uh, Fahrenheit over the last hundred years, but they're getting warmer faster. Uh, so when you, when you worry about a little bit about the climate changing, it is not that it hasn't changed in the past, it's that it's changing really fast now. And now uh, our economies that we've seen even just in the last you know, several years are very sensitive uh, to perturbations. And, uh, and so everything will be affected in one way or another by this. It doesn't mean there aren't opportunities to be had and we should take advantage of them, but it does mean uh, that there is planning that needs to be done and we should do that planning. So uh, we've been hearing this just a couple days ago, I think something came out in the New York Times. Well, geez, are we done now? Uh, hasn't uh, climate change stopped? There's been a pause. Climate change is paused. Well, yeah, it kind of looks that way until you look at the oceans. Uh, so certainly we haven't seen an increase in surface air temperatures in the last 10 to 15 years. That's true. But ocean temperatures, which account for over 90% of the earthwide warming, uh, have continued to increase. So uh, certainly uh, we have not stopped warming uh, on Earth. Okay, so what about northern Wisconsin? What have we seen in northern Wisconsin? I'm gonna show you several slides that are gonna look like this. You're gonna be able to see some detail, but not a lot. I'm just mostly showing you pretty pictures and trying to give you some information. So uh, in terms of uh, what's been observed over the last 110 years, what we've seen is about that same uh, global temperature change, uh, an increase of about one and a half degrees Fahrenheit. Now, what we have also seen is an increase of, uh, a greater increase in minimum temperatures, so it's not getting as cold. This is especially true uh, in the winter, which you can see here, which uh, the increases of the minimum temperatures in the winter and the overall temperatures in the winter have increased faster than anything else. Um, uh, but it's also true in the spring, in the summer, uh, somewhat less true uh, in the fall. But winter is where we're seeing the biggest changes uh, in, in temperature. When we look at precipitation, on the left, yes. on the left, what you'll see is uh, this 110-year trend of very small uh, increase in precipitation, lots of interannual variation, an overall increase of about two inches uh, per year. Uh, but it isn't distributed evenly. Uh, if you see on the right that map, you'll see in the north in northern Wisconsin that it's gotten a bit drier, uh, whereas other parts of Wisconsin are, are making up for that and getting uh, northern Wisconsin are getting a bit wetter. Now, this isn't the same old precipitation regime. This isn't the same old rain and snow uh, that, that have been uh, 
has seen for generations and generations. One of the things that we've also been seeing is that more precipitation, more rain is being delivered in big events, three inch uh, or greater storms, two inch or greater storms. And so uh, you have to think about the delivery of the excess or extra uh, precipitation. A lot of it uh, isn't readily accessible by ecosystems um, or by municipalities. It goes right out of the system because it comes down so hard and so fast. This is a trend that's likely to continue. Uh, so you get on the projections. Uh, now what we do is we always show a range of projections. Uh, one thing to wrap our heads around is we don't necessarily get uh, a projected future with some variability around it. We have to deal with this concept of a range of possible futures that we have to grapple with. And the choices we make, we need to make considering this range of possible futures. In this range that we show here, we have a, a model, the PCM, that is an insensitive model. That means for a given amount of carbon dioxide, it doesn't warm that much. The one on the right, the GFDL, warms a lot more for that amount of carbon. And then the B1 is an emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions scenario. is not that much emissions on the, did I say right? On the left, B1. On the, on the other side, A1FI is more of a business as usual, but is a, is a fast warming emissions scenario. So what you see is over the next 40 years, not that bad, not that much warming across the range. But about mid-century, it begins to take off. And by the end of the century, a much wider difference uh, across that range and much uh, more significant warming uh, at the far end of the range. Now, this is also true, again, like we saw in what we've uh, actually measured. Um, this happens uh, more in the winter, more warming in the winter than you have in the other seasons. Uh, not as, as bad in spring, uh, not as bad in fall, but uh, here in these projections, the summer uh, will also warm. Uh, now, uh, in terms of precipitation, uh, you look uh, on the top two maps, those are annual precipitation. Looks great in the happy scenario. Uh, lots of extra precipitation. Um, in the unhappy-ish, you know, not as great scenario on the right, uh, you see more of a mixed scenario with some drying in the western part of the state. That is mostly driven by what's happening on those bottom maps this summer, where you have a lot of drying in the summer given this combination of model and of emission scenario. So summer and longer growing seasons are something to think about. So my summary uh, is actually pretty simple. In terms of the climate, what about climate? There's overwhelming amounts of information showing uh, that climate has changed uh, and that it's on a trajectory to continue to change. We don't know where it will end up. There is inherent uncertainty in this system that we're gonna have to just embrace and deal with as a normal part of our lives. What about Wisconsin? It's already been changing in Wisconsin, likely to continue changing along the lines of, of what I've shown you. Uh, so then the, uh, certainly the next question is, what do we do now? Well, all of these excellent speakers uh, coming after me are gonna give you all that kinds of uh, information, especially at the very end, uh, Paul Strong, uh, Jerry Greenberg, they will have everything you need to hear. <laughs>